you know me, I'm, a, I'm kind of an emotional guy. But I search for something. I was pretty successful in the world and some things happened to me that pretty much took all the wind out of my sails. And I realized that there is absolutely zero security in the world. And I mean none. I had a moment of clarity and I think God actually does that for you. And I hadn't gone to church in a long time. I never quit believing, but I just didn't think he was close enough or would care. So I came back here. I sat over there because I didn't want to sit with you. I didn't want to have a bunch of questions. I, uh, it was too much. I also had a little pride, I think, and I was scared. I've looked back at those times. I don't know what that was, but I just couldn't. I wanted to be your friend. I wanted to be an associate with you. But I just couldn't do it. It was too tough. So you, you take a step at a time. And I discovered that you guys aren't so bad after all. And the little thing in the bottom of my heart that I wanted more than anything else, I wanted to find a church family where God was important, that you guys in our off times together, if I became your friend, if you would let me, where you held the study of the Bible and you put forward a relationship with him that was very real and it was a big deal to you you know you guys are really unique I've not seen this very many other places although I see it starting in many other churches I think that's the Holy Spirit is drawing us and I think Jesus is getting us ready he has to be number one do you remember the sermon from uh, the Livingston uh, school by the chaplain his main point was, you got to make this the entire focus of your life to the exclusion of everything else. That's really what he was saying. Search for it always. Don't give up. Make God the focus. And there's a reason for that. I wanted that. I knew that that was the only thing that really matters when I first came here. And now as I help out in some of the things as a deacon. I see people leave, and it makes me sad. I've left at different times. I never came to communion here at the beginning. I couldn't. It was too much. It's not that I didn't believe. But I've learned that you have to extend. Never, ever criticize. Extend a loving arm. Let people know that you care about them always. They already are criticizing themselves on the inside. There is zero need for you to add to that burden. But instead, do the opposite. Love them. Go to them. Talk to them. The framework for our entire discussion of why we're here as Christians, as people, as Adventists, is based on one simple thing. Oops, sorry, I went too far. Didn't wait. Sorry, Harrison. Can you back me up one? One more. Back up one more. There we go. This, this is a view put together. They keep doing this, you know. They're adding more and more stuff. This is a view of the sky taken by Hubble. This is the third time they've done this. The first time was about eight hours. The second time was between two and three weeks, continuous exposure by the telescope out in space. This represents about two years. They say this is in the neighborhood of 11 to 12 billion light years. It's so far away we can't really tell. Every last single dot on that picture is an entire galaxy. These are monstrous things. If we could travel at the speed of light across our own, it would take us 100,000 years to make a one-way trip. This is unbelievably huge. In this picture, there are over 5,000 galaxies just sitting there floating. 
And you know, I've, I've loved space all my life. And, I, and I, when I tripped over John 1.1 1, 1 the first time, it, it kind of dawned me, man always stops short in his appreciation of God, so I decided to go the other way. The universe that we're in, and all of these galaxies, it says that he made. And so I've been thinking about that. If you, if you had a sphere with all the galaxies in it, God started before that. He was outside of that. What he's really doing is he's desiring to bring life, but you can't just poof, and there it is, just like him. He knew from the beginning that you got to start small and grow it. That was his plan. So he builds a nursery. Because God is big, he built a big nursery room. It's our universe, and he filled it with, the math suggests, 800 billion galaxies. Oh, man, we're going to be here a long time as kids exploring all of them. I mean, literally an eternity. And who knows, he could do something more after that. That's just stage one. That's primary kindergarten. But I am of a firm belief in my mind that before he built this, before he built the universe, that's where he knew you and you and you and you and you and you and you. I think he was trying to make others. He was bringing life in so that he could, I mean, he's God. He can do absolutely anything. There is zero limits. You can't even suggest a limit to what he could do. And the one thing that he desired was, I think, companionship. And so I think that he knew you, John, way back then before he did this. And he took his time. We know that light from those distant ones travels. I think he's been building the universe for billions of years. He's getting it just right. And the reason is it's because you are a big deal. You are his child. Nothing in this universe is more important than you. Nothing. He desires us to have freedom. And we're going to just detour here real quick. Why is it that, you, that God seems to speak in such a small voice all the time? You and I both know from experience it's easy to run right over God in that little voice and you hear, well, I'll just do this. Sometimes I wish God would speak with a loud horn, a amplifier, and say, Wallace, you really don't want to do that. You've been there. You know where that's going to go. Why are you even entertaining the thought? He never does that. And it finally dawned on me one day, because God never will do that, nor has he ever wanted to do that, he wants to exist with you, and you have freedom. And as you grow, you start going, in my freedom, I can choose to listen to him. But we're never going to get there until we find out he's safe. We're not going to listen. We're never going to yield him full control. And part of the issue is because we don't understand completely, I don't think, who he is. At least I don't. And part of it is we've not understood the gospel and I know that from my association with many, many people. I don't profess to understand it all, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to look, and I will leave no stone unturned in my life because I need to know. And part of that is because I'm afraid. I got nothing. I can see how easily things overwhelm me. I'm getting older. I don't have the energy I used to. And I, you want a reality? We're all going to die. Nobody likes to talk about it. I talked to my dad on Wednesday night, and he said a little comment that he was implying that he was telling me that his, he was weaker, and he could see it coming. He didn't say that, but I knew what he was saying. I wish I could reach out and just stop that. That was... Uh, I was never close to my dad when I was a kid. I hated it. It's only been in the last 10 years, 15 years, that I finally see him for the man that he is, and I absolutely love him to death. 
I don't want him to die, and I don't want to die. The truth of it is, I don't want any of you to die either. So what is it that we have to do as a people and as a denomination to end this? And we can. Twelve disciples with Jesus' instruction and the blessing of the Holy Spirit started a revolution that almost overturned Satan's kingdom. Twelve people. Can you imagine what an entire church could do? We've denied the power. I think it's time. I think the Holy Spirit is getting ready to be poured out. So I go back to the Acts of Apostles and into Acts, the book, and I discover there's something interesting, that Jesus took what the disciples knew and he laid it to, to rest. Everything they knew with their time with him. They had seen him raise people, watched leprosy disappear. You name it, they saw it. They became believers in him. And yet, at his death, they lost it all. Everything they knew disappeared because they knew that on Sunday or Monday, the Romans were going to come after them and haul them off to jail too. Their leader had been taken. It's not hard to get rid of the rest. And yet something amazing happened. He appeared and what they thought happened didn't happen. Instead, Jesus spends about 40 days telling them that he, you know, Mrs. White says in the Bible says that he was explaining the prophecies of the Old Testament, that he was the Savior, the Lamb of the world. He was changing their perceptions. And I'm thinking that's going to happen again. A lot of what we think about our Father, I think we're going to end up there's some stuff we're going to throw out by the wayside. We are going to be people who are entirely dependent on him. I mean, that's it. There won't be any other form of support. Because when you find that kind of a connection with your father, then that's pure and it is true, and then he can work without fear. So I just want to look briefly at some stuff we've been studying. Really, what did Jesus do? When you tell someone, if they ask, what did Jesus do for me? And you tell them Jesus died for your sins. Do you really think that that means anything to them? It's interesting. See, there's a background here that in the very beginning you had harmony and unity in heaven. And God's presence is a forward-moving force. It is pure. It is driving. It is the entire basis of life. There is no backward motion in God's kingdom. There is no repair mechanism necessary or needed. There is no punishment needed. In his presence, things thrive and grow. You never see a tree take its leaves back in in the springtime. So you had an angel that decided that he wanted something else, that he liked that, that he wanted to exist with God outside of the universe because that's really what he was saying. And no created being can understand what that's like to be outside of the universe on a level with God. You cannot possibly fathom, no matter how good the student and Lucifer was the best, you cannot possibly fathom what that is like to maintain that. You cannot wield with no power the forces that hold this universe stable cannot know the depth of a father's love that is taking time to bring children to fruition so Lucifer got mad and he rebelled and he insinuated and he did it in a way that when he talked to the other angels and I read this in Mrs. White's stuff on a number of times that when he insinuated his stuff he did it in such a way that they thought it popped into their heads on their own he was that good We cannot have any conversations with Satan at all. He's much too strong. So after he gets man to sin, and by the way, this is a review because it's coming. When Satan got man to sin, he did it outside the bounds of their reality. He showed them something that was so spectacular that they did not expect. And he's going to do it again. No one in Eden 
had ever seen a talking animal. It was outside of their reality. We should expect a similar attack at the end of time like that, and you all know what I'm talking about. There's something coming that will be outside of our reality. So then he stands to God and he says, he can't have justice and mercy because he knew that the father's plan was to save those kids. And yet here he is kicked out, out of rebellion. He said, you can't do both. You can't have justice for me and mercy for them. I've presented that quote up here. God just smiles and he says, okay, we're going to let this run. And it gets right down to Noah, one righteous man. And God has to intervene because Jesus is going to come as a man walking in our humanity. He takes our place, so he has to have someone who will believe in him. That line never was broken. I've talked to people who've worked with me on this. When Jesus died, he took guilt and punishment, yours and mine, to the cross. He bore that. In exchange, he gives us life. So when I feel burdened, when you feel weak, when a friend of yours passes away, when you are overwhelmed by depression, and let me tell you, that is a plague everywhere. This spring has been horrible. Discouragements. Wives and husbands not getting along, arguing, and can't figure out what in the world is going on. Forget politics. See, Satan does all that, and the reason is is because we're coming to something. And I think we're coming to a realization that we're finally going to understand, and it only comes from God, not from us, that you have Jesus' life, his perfect life. I mean, really have it. The responsibility for sin stayed with Satan, and we see that in the most holy place. We all know about 1844, Jesus went there. The city was given to him and us. We weren't present at the wedding, but it still was given to him. He's ready to come home. He's ready to come get his kids. So what he does is he sprinkles his blood on everything, and then he puts responsibility on Satan. And that is essentially the end of time. That is the book of Revelation. He's ready to do it. He wants to move on. I think the only people in the universe who don't understand the difference between good and evil is this world. This is why it is very clear that when Satan and his angels were swirling around Christ on the cross, the only, it was horrible. And they finally got what was going on. That this little bit of rebellion, this, well, I can do it my way, turned into full-blown murder. Satan would kill his own father and did. And the only way he was able to is because the father pulled back his protection. That is the wrath of God. Christ experienced the wrath. And it's simply the father pulling away. Because without him, there is nothing. You go back to nothing. Father doesn't have to punish you. All he has to do is pull away a little and Satan will get at you and tear your soul from you. That I have seen. He will bring a ton of garbage and just dump it on your door. It's time to say no. I'm tired of it. So I look. So what do you do with your sin? If we have Jesus' life right now, Remember, Paul says that um, Jesus sees us as if we were in heaven already. It's always been a tough one to figure out. See, the only thing that's holding us back from that is we still haven't quite got rid of some of the questions. We could go home today. But we still, once in a while, entertain things that have no place. We need passion. And you can't have any of those things until you actually understand what Jesus did for you. And today on Communion Sabbath, all Jesus said, and it makes some people uncomfortable on Communion, 
All Jesus was saying is remember. Remember what I did for you. Remember that I took the sin, the sin that you feel. You don't have to have that anymore. You can have my life. I give it to you as a free gift. And I wore this coat specifically today because at Christmas time my dad wanted to buy me something. I didn't want it. He's already done it too much for me in my life. And he just simply took it off the hanger and put it on my shoulders. Salvation is like that. Jesus is like that. So we have to know that our Father loves us. I keep hammering that point. It is true. That's why this is continuing. Our Father would have us know things about him. So here you have to go into another little difficult area. I know that we are admonished in Mrs. White to make decisions and choose, and it's the will, and et cetera, et cetera. But I can tell you this, that I will fail every time unless another agency is brought into my life. And I believe firmly that that only power that can actually have us say no repeatedly to Satan because he will accuse forever, the only thing that is ever going to be able to stop that is Jesus living in me, his power. I may choose to say, I don't want that, but it has to be God doing it. This is a new thing for me. I, I don't understand how he would do that. I'm starting to understand why. All I can say is that I, would, I want to let him do that, whatever it is. There's nothing else on the other side. I choose him. And to the best of my ability, I will do it every time. So how do you do that? What do you do with the sin? You pray. You study the word. And you stick together as a family. As God intended you. Be a family. Rub shoulders with your brothers and sisters. I have learned so much for you. And if anything, I want to say thank you to each and every one of you today for allowing me into your lives. Couldn't have done it without you. I didn't have the courage. When I tell you in private sometimes, people go, oh, no, not me. I, I didn't do that. Well, I'm going to say publicly, you did. You have no idea how much that means. We can be uplifted by the Spirit. We can walk with him in a focus that we have not yet seen. Let us stop bickering. Let us become volunteers. Let us draw together. Let's pray together. Let's start turning the television off. Stop worrying about your finances. Forget your retirement. Let it rise or let it lie shallow, dormant, because in the end it doesn't really matter. I know that sounds ridiculous in today's world, but I'm not wrong. Above all, we have to let God in. We can't be afraid anymore. We have to stop putting barriers on him. There's nothing he can't do. That's where I want to dwell. I want to sit there. Whatever my problems are, I'm going to go freely to him and say, God, you deal with this first. I'd rather follow your lead because I can't do it. <laughs> Why would I even try anymore? You first, I'll follow you. On communion, we remember that he's already done it. So communion isn't so bad. We have a special day, and he, the presence of the Spirit draws close to us this day. And I'm grateful for that. So I just want to say thank you. Let's bow our heads. Father, you are the presence here today, the fabric that not only holds the universe together, but you're the source of life, and you wish to dwell in us. Help us realize that, Father. Whatever it is, let our voices be still and our minds drawn only to you. Let us put away doubt. 
so that we can truly walk with you and depend on you and rely on you. We ask you to be with us today, Father. Touch everyone here today. And we thank you for you and for loving us. In your name, amen. We have uh, a class in the sanctuary here and one here. We have Sabbath school classes that meet in the very far hallway. And you are welcome, if a, as a visitor or as a member, to go to any class you would like. There's also a class in the fellowship hall, too, which is about halfway down that hall. <laughs>